of the 236th anniversary of the Great Conflagration of 1788, which burned the colony of New Orleans. On March 21, 1788, New Orleans was still a colony composed mostly of small wooden shacks made of cypress wood. The wood was gathered from the old growth cypress swamps that were cleared to build the colony. Cypress is naturally resistant to the wetness of its swampy Louisiana climate, But that resistance is facilitated by an oil that the plant creates, an oil that is highly flammable. To set the scene, Miro was governor and Père Antoine was not quite yet the beloved priest of New Orleans, but he was the rector of the parish church, which was the Church of St. Louis, not yet a cathedral. He had wrapped the bells in burlap or cotton to prevent them from ringing in the unusual wind as it was Good Friday a solemn occasion, and bells are joyous. The Spanish Inquisition was wreaking its havoc. The French Revolution was underway, but not yet at its crescendo, and New Orleans was a 70-year-old French-turned-Spanish colony in the swamp, still 15 years from joining America. We have first-hand accounts from both Governor Miro, Père Antoine, as well as a visitor whose March 26th account was published in the Dunlap and Claypool American Daily Advertiser in Philadelphia, Pennsylvania, on Saturday, September 27th, 1788. Quote, On Friday the 21st, Good Friday, about half after one o'clock at noon, a fire broke out at a large house, the treasurer's, not far from the church, which burned with irresistible fury and communicating to the adjacent building, soon attained the guardhouse from thence to the church and continued for five hours, carrying ruin and devastation to all quarters of the town. There were neither fire engines, buckets, hooks, nor ladders, so that every effort was in vain. The whole town was laid in ashes before eight o'clock at night, except the front row and two streets to the westward, which were preserved by the wind, blowing strongly the whole time from the south and southeast. By a late calculation, this city was supposed to contain 5,500 souls. This, at six to a family, will make the number of houses upwards of 900, of which not 200 are now remaining. The havoc caused by this dreadful conflagration originated at the house of a zealous gentleman who, not satisfied with worshiping God in the usual way, had a chapel or altar erected in his house for the purpose of paying adoration, and which he had illuminated with fifty or sixty wax tapers, as if his prayers could not ascend to heaven without them. These lights being left neglected at the hour of dinner set fire to the ceiling. From thence proceeded the destruction of the most regular, well-governed small city in the Western world." From Governor Miro's account, we get details of his decisions to rescue the colony from devastation after the fire, including immediately arranging tents for anyone who couldn't find a friend to stay with whose home was not destroyed. Quote, Many have taken temporary lodgings with families that were so fortunate as to escape unscathed, and to such an extent have the compassionate feelings of the latter shown forth that on the following day there was not a single human being without shelter. Unquote. Miro also sent ships to Philadelphia to retrieve flour, nails, medicines, and other necessities. This type of trade was not yet allowed at the time. In fact, there were prisoners in New Orleans at the time of the fire confined for bringing goods from Philadelphia to New Orleans. Still a Spanish colony and not yet in trade relations with the developing United States. After the fire, many people used the tents provided to seek refuge in St. Anthony's Garden, where Père Antoine had his shack in temporary housing, as so many people were homeless. 
but this housing was not free. Shannon Lee Dottie points out in Archaeological Investigations at St. Anthony's Garden, Volume 2, that there were rental fees attached to the temporary housing, which provided income for the church. While Don Almanaster is credited with funding the rebuilding of the church, along with many other prominent structures in New Orleans, the rental fees paid by the homeless, along with funding from the Spanish crown, helped complete the project when Almanaster decided he wasn't being honored enough for his generosity and withdrew his support. Père Anton was banished from the colony in 1790, supposedly because of his Inquisition intentions, but some speculate it was because of his refusal to ring the bells during the fire. He returned to the colony in 1795, after the second fire, and after the dedication of the newly rebuilt church. Interestingly, contemporary accounts do not mention any souls lost in the blaze. In 2018, the Monroe News Star printed a This Day in History entry about the incident, saying one person died in the flames. Ghost stories may lead you to believe that the prisoners were abandoned and many souls were lost. Miro explained at the time, quote, The public jail was also destroyed, and hardly had we time to save the lives of the unfortunate prisoners. Unquote. I suppose this translation is ambiguous enough to mean either they saved them or they did not. Miro did report one enslaved woman who died and sick people who could not escape on their own, according to C. Ermus in their Florida State University master's thesis entitled The Good Friday Fire of 1788, Implications of a Disaster in Spanish Colonial New Orleans. Six years later, in 1794, another fire claimed about 200 of the city's rebuilt structures, starting from the same block as the 1788 fire. The disaster opened up trade with the United States, which was extremely limited before the fire. Spain had restricted trade on the Mississippi River to only Spain in 1784. Regulations were loosened in 1787, but the Gulf of Mexico was still restricted. The need for supplies loosened regulations of who was allowed in the Gulf and Mississippi River, and Miro pounced on the opportunity. The main outcome of the fires of 1788 and 1794 that we still see today is transforming the French colony into a Spanish colony in appearance. New construction regulations followed, including slate or tile roofs and building from bricks typically made from Mississippi River mud and later from clay found north of the lake covered with stucco. New buildings were built right up to the street so that there were no gardens to catch fire. Their front yards moved to the back of the buildings and became courtyards with brick firewalls surrounding them to stop fire from spreading easily. The courtyards accessed via narrow walkways on the side of the building. These changes morphed New Orleans from a French colony of wooden homes and gardens to a more cosmopolitan Spanish colonial city. The fires of the late 18th century are the reason the French Quarter of New Orleans is Spanish. <laughs>